next now to talk about these proposed changes is Ontario's Minister of Health, Sylvia Jones. Thanks so much for joining us, Minister. Thank you, Tammy. Appreciate your interest. Uh, now, to start off, how quickly do you think there will be an impact on the, these, this backlog once these changes do go through? Almost immediately. We expect that we'll be back to pre-pandemic uh, waitlist levels by March of 2023. And then as we continue to be able to expand the system, uh, we expand, expect that expansion to happen by uh, 2024. And so if the backlog should be resolved by March of 2023, why not stop it there and then scale back so that we can keep some of the public surgeries then in the public sphere? Yeah, my apologies. Pre-pandemic wait list by March of 2023 and then an expansion into 2024. But I want to be uh, clear that we are going to continue to use a combination of hospital and community surgical units because we need both. We have wait times where people are waiting, frankly, too long for cataract, hip and knee surgeries. And we want them to be back in community, back with their families to make sure that they are not waiting and languishing on wait lists. That is our motivation uh, completely and 100 percent to this expansion. We've already seen through uh, additional funding given to, given to our hospital partners, that they were able to expand their surgical times, their, their ability to have those surgical units open. But we also need to expand the existing community surgical units that are available in many cases closer to home, but most importantly, sooner so that the people aren't on those wait lists for months and months. Now, the news of the expansion, that's what has many critics, including the opposition, concerned that this could be a slippery slope. Where is the line? Where is the line going to be drawn in terms of what type of procedures will be done in privately or privately run facilities? Yeah, you know, we have almost 300 existing community uh, surgical and diagnostic operating in the province of Ontario already, uh, primarily for cataract surgeries and diagnostics. And those are, are procedures that can often happen outside of the hospital setting because they are routine and they are pretty consistent in approach. We will absolutely continue to use hospital partners for the more critical and uh, complex cases. But I'll give you a Real example, you know, a regularly scheduled uh, surgery that you might have for hips or knees in your local hospital can end up having to be rescheduled because there is an emergency and they need that operating room for other emergency patients coming in. That would be an example of something that isn't necessarily and likely to happen in a community surgical setting. But are, can you draw a line and can you commit to? holding this at this proposal and not expanding it even further so that even more complex surgeries can be done somewhere private and essentially create a two-tier system. There is no two-tier system that is going to be happening in the province of Ontario. We have made it very clear, Premier Ford has said often, that OHIP covered services will continue to be provided by your OHIP card, not your credit card. We'll continue that work because we understand people have confidence in our system here in Ontario and Canada. What we want to do is work harder to make sure that people who are waiting for those surgeries that are impacting their quality of life don't have months and months uh, languishing on a waiting list, frankly, getting sicker. Uh, we want to make sure that those cataract, those hips, those knee surgeries that, as I said, can happen safely in community setting and already do happen in community setting can be expanded. Now, one question the, pre the Premier did not answer yesterday was one that was brought up by a few people, including Richard Southern from City News, asking about the potential of upselling and how the province is going to monitor and prevent some of these private clinics from upselling so that they can make a profit. Because again, this is these are for-profit clinics and facilities. Uh, there is also not-for-profit. So it is Right, but most are profit. Most are for-profit. So I'll give you a very specific example. So with cataract surgeries, uh, what we have is we have an OHIP funded uh, procedure for cataract surgeries. If in conversation with your clinician, it is established that there is a different lens that would be appropriate, perhaps because you have an astigmatism, uh, you have that option of purchasing. It will ultimately be a conversation between the clinician and the patient, but 
it always will be OHIP funded for the, uh, the surgery itself. For the basics itself, but then to stop the upselling within these clinics in order for them, because they have to, you know, reach that bottom line, they, they do need to make profit. So what can the province do to stop that? Because then again, you said there's no two-tier system, but essentially this is sort of creating that. There are people who can't afford it. No, I, I disagree. So what we have is we have clinicians having conversations with their patients about based on uh, what you have, based on the type of um, cataract surgery that is necessary, you qualify and you will be given cataract surgery. Whether you want and you decide that they're that uh, you would like to have a different type of lens, whether it is, as I said, for a particular type of issue that you have based on, on your particular individual choice, those are consumer and patient choice options that are happening today. Whether it is in community surgeons, uh, hospitals, they are daily happening between a surgeon and their patient, and those will continue. Now, another example would be we fund, of course, uh, for hospital beds, uh, but you have the choice of whether you want to have a semi-private room or a private, um, a wheelchair, you have an OHIP-funded wheelchair, uh, whether you need or want to have a different model, then there may be a uh, increase based on your personal needs and uh, and wants and desires. There has been an Auditor General report, though, that show that there, there has been fraud reported within a, a lot of these clinics when it comes to upselling. We don't want to paint all of these clinics with the same brush, of course, but fraud has been widely reported there. And so is the province looking to monitor? How are you going to safeguard that? So clinicians, physicians and surgeons, whether they operate in community, whether they are in a hospital setting, all have the same oversight through the uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. And that will absolutely continue because we know that the people have confidence in their healthcare system and we want to make sure that that continues. So that oversight piece is really important and will continue and in fact with legislation if passed be strengthened. But I want to assure people these are physicians who were trained, licensed in the province of Ontario to work whether in hospital or in community settings. They all have the same oversight and the, the uh, same quality of service that people expect and deserve. And this is a big question as well uh, when it comes to staffing, because this is a major concern. We're already seeing staffing shortages within the healthcare system. Will the province then drop the appeal and allow the repealing of Bill 124 in order to keep more staff where they are and attract more staff with wage increases? So there is no doubt that we have seen how valuable and important and professional and committed uh, nurses and healthcare professionals have been in the province of Ontario. It is why we provided a $5,000 uh, incentive and uh, retention pay for full-time nurses working in the province of Ontario. We're also working very closely with the College of Nurses of Ontario to license additional quickly nurses. We have had a historic year in 2022. Over 6,000 new internationally educated uh, nurses are now practicing and licensed in the province of Ontario. Historic high. We've expanded the number of spaces that are available within our college and university settings through the work of Minister Dunlop to make sure that we have additional opportunities for training. And as a result of a program called Learn and Stay, we, again, have had a historic number of uh, young people interested in training and uh, practicing and nursing. Sorry There's to interrupt no as well, Minister, but just to ask you once again, are, can you commit to dropping the appeal? No, we also have a responsibility to make sure that we are fiscally responsible in the province of Ontario. We've, we've invested over $14 billion additionally since 2018 in the healthcare system alone, but we do have fiscal concerns that we must be uh, cognizant of and aware, and we're working both with our, our uh, partners, our professionals, to make sure that while we expand the number of available nursing and healthcare professionals in the province of Ontario, we do that in a fiscally responsible way. Okay, a lot of those nurses as well have those fiscal concerns. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Jones. I really do appreciate it uh, and uh, appreciate your time here this morning with us. Stay well. You too.